off. You're looking right in the lens now this time. You're corrupting her. There you go. Keep going. So how do you like your Wally Goody? I like my Goody. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a couple of years since I entered the scooter market, and now a week goes by that I don't get asked, how did you get the scooters, Joel? Well, I'm going to try to answer that in 10 minutes or less with Malaguti Scooters, which I met when I was in... One summer, I was volunteering at my dad's uh, scooter shop back in Miami, and a guy from Malaguti walked in, told me, hey, have you ever heard of Malaguti? I said, no, I've heard of Vespa, but I've never heard of Malaguti. I helped him do some research, and a few weeks later, I had a ticket to Milan to the show. And a couple years later, I'm signing a contract with Mr. Malaguti. Here I am in my early 20s. Uh, actually, this is 2001, the year right after college with my buddies from school. We were all DJs and promoters. And we started. We started. We left the DJ scene from Gainesville. I was a DJ. I worked for Sony Music, EA Sports, Electronic Arts. And uh, I threw raves. And I worked for a lot of different promotion companies, a couple of sneaker companies. And I got into the scooter market thanks to my dad. Uh, he ran a shop named Mr. Scooter since 1994 with my grandfather and my family here in Miami. He sold over 4,000 scooters one year. They were all great market imports from Japan. He would buy them by the container. Uh, and thanks to my grandfather, he gave me the money and uh, I borrowed from the SBA and I started my first little loan. And I started importing the Malaguti scooters into the U.S. They were the best. Family owned and operated since 1929. During the 1920s, Antonino Sr. Uh, was a bicycle champion. He actually bicycled from one end of Italy to the other. And he was renowned and known all over Bologna and the Emilia-Romagna region. He, his idea was to put a little engine on the bicycles like everybody else was doing in uh, Bologna. And he sold a ton of them with uh, 12 people in the first original factory. Uh, he took his bicycle em uh, company and made a little empire. It was great. He also started making scooters right around the same time as Lumbra and Vespa, except they didn't believe in the export market. So uh, we never really saw them in the U.S. until the 70s, where after the Paris show and the U.S. crisis, the oil crisis, they started importing them by the airplane, by the boatload. There were over three U.S. importers in the 70s and overnight the u.s market crashed because we didn't need the mopeds anymore uh, most of them ended up in california during the vietnam war the majority of the exports were going to saigon uh, that's where the saigon 50 came from and malaguti mostly ignored uh, the, the u.s market during the 80s until about uh, 1999 when i met them uh, when i was in college and they said hey you know what vespa's going into the u.s aprilia our main competitors going into the u.s we want to get there malaguti was very huge in italy they were italy's third largest manufacturer family owned and operated. They never sold stock. They were not. They didn't have investors, and they like to do things their way. When I met them, I was amazed that there was a scooter company I had never heard about. So here you got this 19-year-old kid. He's in college. He has no idea what's going on, and uh, you see his family. That reminds you of your family. I worked with my grandfather and my father, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to work for the corporate world. Let me follow my passion. For some reason, there's a family out there just like ours. Let's do scooters. But like everything, it's more complicated than it seems. They made a great product, but it was made in Italy. Uh, at the time, the dollar exchange rate was uh, 2,200 lira to the dollar. So it made sense. I mean, I was following in Antonino Jr.'s, uh, the third generation's footsteps here, and I thought, I could do this. There's no way I can, I can stop. And I said, let's import the Malaguti line. So we signed the contract. We exhibited at the Indiana Dealer Expo in 2001. This was our booth. It was great. We had most of the floor on the second floor of the uh, – convention center, my father, my grandfather, there. there's my best friend, uh, Ian Kirby with Captain Kirby. My first container was 100 bikes of the same color and I sold them in a month and then we started promoting. My other best friends, Chris and Justin and I, we were out there promoting every weekend. We rock so hard, we have our own band. <laughs> We marketed in totally different ways from everybody, even in Cycle World. You can check this out. Yes, the market crashed. Uh, by September of 2001, uh, the tragedy happened, September 11th, and we lost about 30 dealers by January. We still did the shows. We did Ducati Revs America in Las Vegas in October 2001. We did the Source Awards. America was uh, still coming out September 11th, but we were promoting hard. Here's Shaggy and the F12. We had Jamie Presley from My Name is Earl on there. We had uh, 2002, we had Ewan McGregor, Ben Bostrom. We were working hard. I mean, I was there working getting the message out on Malaguti to all the Ducati dealers in America, all the scooter dealers. We went out to Laguna Seca two years in a row. Uh, by the third year, we realized, hey, you know, something's a little different here. And there were a lot of things we didn't have control over, but we could market the, as best. We even tried the, the rallies. Here's at Mile High Mayhem. I mean, we reached out as many places as we could. And we had some really great dealers like Sportique Scooters, 
And uh, some supporters like Steven Tyler would use our, our bikes in their videos. We had uh, Mark Anthony, the Playmates, and we started promoting heavily with uh, Playboy. I mean, every celebrity that we could get on the bikes. I mean, that was the edge, and we followed exactly the plan, which was, what is uh, what is everybody else doing? How do we reach the most number of people? And you know, Hugh Hefner rode a scooter, and we got him into Playboy, and we did Playboy Spring Break three years in a row, and it was great. My dad and I and our friends, we all had a great time. There's my father on Manning the Scooter Gang. Uh, we had a fantastic time. But at the same time, fundamentals in the U.S. economy were beginning to slide. And we could see that. I mean, we did lose about 30 dealers. We gave it another shot. 2002 was a terrific year. But, you know, as we entered early 2003, all the hype, all the, all the promotion um, wasn't really translating into, uh, you know, a profits. And that's something that we have to look at. We, I mean, we were great at promoting. It's a sleek, sexy bike, high quality, better than the uh, majority of the things out there. Um, and Aprilia, we gave Aprilia a run for their money. I mean, they mentioned this at their annual uh, dealer meeting. Uh, Bezio actually said we were the worst threat to Aprilia uh, that they had seen. And we managed to, to match them in sales for two years in a row in the U.S. In 2002 and 2003, we were selling more scooters than they were. Uh, not as many as Vespa, but we did our job. But the, the economy was changing. So while we were marketing and getting the word out with Playboy and the Playboy Spring Break, um, you know, things were changing. We did over 100 supermarkets across the country. We did promotions with St. Polygro beer, with Peroni beer. Uh, we had the limited edition scooters. So we were the first to come out with special edition paints from pink scooters with white wall tires to uh, limited edition signed by artists uh, with tattoos. And here we are at the 2003 Indie Show. We had a great booth. Uh, but we know it's a change, and the change really was the Chinese were coming, and the prices were going down. And even my father, who just saw saw it, he saw it coming. Here we have the new the new electric check, written by Mr. Chris Esposito, Call of Duty Factory. We got Mr. Uh, Jay and Paul from Nalts Ducati, the number one Ducati dealer in the country, happened to be visiting the Call of Duty Factory. So we brought in the prototype electric bikes that didn't work. The electric angle wasn't there yet. The technology wasn't like Vectrix there, but we tried. We had the Levi's bikes on display at all the Levi's dealerships and the Levi's boutiques. We were on VIP, the TV show. We had Pam Anderson riding our bikes. Uh, we went out to World Ducati Week, uh, promoting with the Ducati dealers and the high-end dealers, but they couldn't make a profit. 17% margins, despite having Shriner groups and clubs buying the Malagutis, they just couldn't make money. And the fundamentals weren't there. I mean, the Ducati dealers, we, we advertise in Cycle World, uh, you know, at $15,000 uh, advertising. Uh, all the Ducati events, we had the special edition Fila bikes, the Ben Bostrom scooter. All these things were great, but it was high end. It could not feed or pay people's bills. So if the dealer can't make a, a buck and we couldn't make a buck and the dollar kept slight, even despite being with Victoria Silver set there, on E Entertainment or having great dealerships like Ride, which was the first Ital Jet and Aprilia dealer in the country, um, we just couldn't survive. They couldn't survive in 15, 17% margins. We couldn't survive. And that was the reason a lot of the Bespa boutiques in the early days closed. Um, you know, you look at a lot of the ownership behind these stores, and, you know, uh, Vespa Miami has had three owners. Uh, a lot of the Vespa dealers come and go, and that was the reason. Uh, our Malaguti boutiques, the, the two that opened, were dealers that were spurred by Vespa that they didn't want them to open the local uh, boutique so they opened one but you know we told them hey you know don't invest three hundred thousand dollars in a, a one line only store it won't make money a lot of the ducati only stores the probably only stores have done that have gone out of business despite having great toys great marketing a great name made in italy better warranty better than anything coming out of asia uh you know Malaguji just couldn't survive on its own. We tried the Cycle World shows. We spent, we had toys. We sent out posters. We had ads. Um, but, you know, at the same time, it's hard to give great warranty and good margins when the dollar is sliding. Honestly, we, in all honesty, we made some mistakes. But, you know, you can't fight world commodity prices. And here at 2004 at the Indy Show, the dealers weren't buying anything. They were buying Chinese. And when I'm watching other importers selling 599 or 350 FOB China, there's no way we could fight that. The, we watched the stores close, the boutiques like Ride closed, the Aprilia dealers were closing. It became an Asian market. Whether anybody was importing from Taiwan or China, they were making the money because the dollar became worthless on the international market. And it still is. It's really hard for a lot of people to make a buck. Now the Chinese are cannibalizing each other. But back to Malaguti, it's a wonderful brand. It's going to be around for another 70 years. They've been in Bologna three generations. I love the company. Hopefully someday they can make a comeback like Atel Jet or Benelli. Um, they need to team up with somebody. They're still there. I love the Malaguti family. I love the dealers who are still supporting us. 
um, with our new company. And if you need parts, you can still contact us and get them. Um, but that's the story how I got the scooter.